Good morning, everyone. Um, we'll let everyone start um, taking their seats, but we will get started here. Welcome to workshop 30, Management of CF Pulmonary Infections. I'm happy to be here um, with my co-chair, Anthony Fisher from the University of Iowa. I am Christina Mengora, an adult pulmonologist from the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, we have five speakers here for you today, and thank you to all of them for their work and coming here to present. They will have approximately 15 minutes or so for their presentations, and each presentation will be followed up by a period for questions and answers. Everyone here in the room, we invite you to use the microphone in the center aisle um, to come up and share your questions, and anyone who is um, streaming or watching from the overflow, if we get to there, um, you can also submit questions in the app, which we will be um, following and monitoring as well. Um, so, without further ado, we'd like to begin our session and introduce our first presenter today. Um, we have uh, Dr. Jonathan Koff from the um, from Yale University here to present their lab's work with cystic fibrosis bacteriophage study at Yale. Great, thank you very much. Um, appreciate the invitation to speak. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about our clinical trial called SciFi, uh, Cystic Fibrosis Bacteriophage Study at Yale. So it's a single center uh, phage study. And let me see how I can do this. So I don't have any uh, financial disclosures, but Yale is licensing intellectual property related to these phages to a company. So I want to make sure you're aware of that. Um, in terms of what I'm going to run through, everybody now is a bacteriophage expert after the plenary session yesterday, so I'm going to just quickly review some pertinent uh, pieces um, of that and then uh, talk about some of the um, data that we have and then uh, future directions, but I'm obviously interested in, in a lot of feedback in terms of uh, how to proceed. So, oh, I've already messed up. There we go. Okay, so yeah, that was how quick we're going to go through uh, 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 bacteriophage. Um, so, uh, uh, so these are viruses that are specific to bacteria, um, discovered in the early 1900s, uh, um, and um, a lot of um, work has been done in, and continued to be done in, since the 1920s in in Eastern Europe. But uh, basically, um, uh, because of the advent of antibiotics, we uh, lost interest. Uh, we're going to focus on lytic phages for human therapy. So uh, by lytic, I mean uh, this life cycle here where the phage is going to uh, infect a bacterial cell, um, hijack the uh, intracellular machinery, and then lead to progeny. Um, and this is a self-amplifying process. So it does bring up an interesting question about um, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics for uh, this particular intervention as we try and monitor a single phage being able to produce multiple uh, progeny. Um, the other really interesting aspect uh, for phage therapy is the potential to think about this from a personalized medicine approach where you give a specific phage or you have a phage that's going to work against the pseudomonas, for example, that we have in um, our, the sputum of our patients. So from a phage therapy perspective, like I said, the concept was really straightforward. Uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So if we can find a, a pathogen for the bacteria uh, that are problematic, then we can use it as a therapy. And uh, this work continued um, uh, uh, with uh, very consistent work in the, since the 1920s. Um, and um, Dr. Jarrell is uh, credited with kind of the uh, idea of phage therapy, self-administered phages to himself and then treated patients, and then went over to Tbilisi, Georgia with Dr. Eliava, which is, an, um, and the institute is now called the Eliava Institute. The reason I highlight that is we can find in the literature upwards of 400,000 cases uh, f in Russian translated into English um, with additional uh, cases in the Polish literature, et cetera. So there's quite a bit of uh, evidence for phage exposure to patients. Uh, but as you can see here, there's a, a lack of clarity about some really important issues in terms of uh, standardization and purification of the phage prep, um, uh, you know, actually doing relevant clinical trials with efficacy endpoints and a variety 
variety of approaches for delivery that may or may not be relevant to the infection of interest. And so therefore, with this background, we obviously need uh, well-designed clinical trials to address this question. From our experience, we um, started with a compassionate treatment approach to phage therapy for multidrug resistant and pandrug resistant pseudomonas. Um, this, uh, I presented this data uh, in different formats here uh, at, at NACFC at prior conferences previously. It's, um, it's med archived if everyone's interested and it's currently under review, uh, but the basic concept is this is a population before uh, modulator therapy. So we started treatments as, as far back as 2018, um, and, um, and so the patients did not have access to modulators. You can see here they had very high uh, bacterial CFUs, and after phage therapy, which was seven to ten days um, uh, uh, nebulized with some differences in the approaches, you can see we saw a, a very nice um, decrease increase in the amount of bacterial CFUs in, in these patients. These are nine patients uh, total, as you can see here on the right. In addition, uh, there was this interesting effect wherein some of the patients with the higher starting FEV1s, they had more of a response in terms of their FEV1. Um, and so that gave us some encouragement that with this type of phage therapy, we may be able to um, see a concomitant uh, change in lung function. Um, Having said that, that was the kind of impetus for this. I'll also give you another um, case here specifically, which is an older gentleman. This is actually non-CF bronchiectasis, but we've been treating him since 2018. Initially got a cocktail because he was relatively sick in the, in the hospital, but we did uh, single sequential therapy over time since then. And so we're looking at 2018 all the way to uh, a couple months ago. And what you can see here is the use of uh, different phages targeting different bacteria over time with some evidence for maintaining a low FEV1 and a lot of evidence for clinical stability. What we found interesting is the longitudinal approach. We started with um, bacterial titers in the 10 to the 7th range and were able to see quite a bit of uh, decrease uh, over time that persisted over time with these continued therapies. And so we've spent a lot of time thinking about the best approach for cystic fibrosis. Um, there's, a, there's a barrier uh, that's very obvious that supports cocktail, which is it's easier to get intellectual property and licensing for, uh, for pharma to, uh, from a cocktail approach. But thinking about what would be the best therapy, we wanted to uh, think about this kind of an idea of cocktail versus single phage therapy. So from a bacterial killing, um, you can presume cocktail is going to be better, but there's some evidence that based upon endotoxin levels, um, you know, having to be divided across multiple phages, you may be starting with a lower titer. Um, we also know that phages are self-amplifying, so this opens up the question about what actual uh, amount of phage do you need in the system to be effective. Host range can be um, uh, manipulated in, in both co uh, cocktail and um, single to have a phage that works effectively across multiple uh, pathogens. Um, resistance going to uh, happen for, especially in pseudomonas, for both the cocktail and the single approach. We have a evolutionary strategy that I don't have uh, uh, too much uh, time to get into, but basically we actually want to push resistance in order for a, a trade-off where we can decrease virulence in the surviving bacteria. That also can happen with cocktail. It just has, we can have more of a specific targeted effect with single. And then the immune response as we monitor it might be better for single and might be better for nebulized. So when we think about what we're targeting here for chronic therapy, which is where I wanted to think about bringing this into the CF community, we thought that a single sequential inhaled approach would be the best. And so the clinical trial is really based upon that strategy, but to, in order to begin, we just wanted to give one uh, iteration of an inhaled phage. So this was a phase one, two uh, study. Uh, it's really a 1B, 2A type of study where we're using an inhaled phage to, um, sorry, did that again, um, to, 
to look at um, the potential safety uh, and uh, microbial endpoint for a single seven-day administration of, of, of inhaled phage. Um, and so you can see uh, that we ended up with um, four subjects in the intervention group, which we called YPT01, uh, so Yale Phage Therapy 01. Um, that was a single phage that was selected from three different phages, so whichever of those three was the best compared to placebo. Um, we uh, started right in the middle of the um, uh, pandemic, um, uh, so uh, that is its own issue uh, that I'm happy to, to talk with uh, talk with anyone about. We did use GMP production for uh, the phage, and um, we, um, uh, as I mentioned, did seven days of inhaled therapy. <clears throat> So in terms of inclusion, I'm just highlighting for you uh, in the interest of time, just um, patients needed to be um, comfortable with induced sputum. Um, Pseudomonas uh, was chronic. Um, we had stable disease with um, uh, no recent exacerbations and a baseline uh, FEV1 above 40%, um, and we took up to 100%. And if patients were on modulator, they had to be on modulator for at least two months. It turns out everybody was on modulator for at least five months. Uh, uh, with some patients being on modulator as long as two years. Basic exclusion for, for most of the uh, clinical trials, I guess the only interesting thing is we uh, removed any, anything for neutropenia based upon some uh, modeling data, uh, but that's really usually not an issue for our patient population. And then we uh, excluded patients if their phage was, um, if the phage was not uh, effective against the pseudomonas that they had. So this was a targeted uh, approach. Primary endpoint is uh, change in pseudomonas from baseline at uh, day 14, which would be seven days after completion of the inhaled phage therapy. Um, and then the uh, safety was uh, looking at um, first whether or not there was an adverse event related to nebulization of the phage, um, and second, whether or not there was any evidence of adverse events over time uh, up until day 56. Uh, there's a variety of secondary and tertiary endpoints that are basically looking at uh, microbiologic uh, 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 effects, human inflammation, and uh, antibody um, uh, uh, presentation. Um, this is the um, this is basically the trial uh, um, uh, plan, um, and what I'm highlighting for you on the right is first administration was in the clinic. Um, we then asked uh, patients to go home to do a single nebulized administration after airway clearance for the rest of seven days. We've had multiple visits with the patients. Uh, we did spirometry before and after the initial uh, phage therapy to confirm that there wasn't any evidence of bronchospasm. Um, and uh, it, sputum was actually induced. Uh, this is an error here from a prior iteration. Um, and so we induced in, in all patients. Sometimes it likes when I hit everything, sometimes not. Sorry about that. Um, for, for In terms of patient characteristics, I'd just highlight for you that um, the uh, patients in the placebo group had lower lung function uh, at the outset. This is, uh, again, four patients higher um, in, the, in the phase. This was not statistically significant with these small numbers. Interestingly, a lower lung function was associated with higher CFUs for pseudomonas and, um, and the opposite effect in, in, the, in the phage intervention group. Otherwise, the patients were very um, consistent uh, across this small cohort. In terms of safety, there are no safety events with nebulization of the phage on day one, uh, which is very encouraging and matches with all of the data that we have from our compassionate cases. Um, and, um, you know, the majority, I haven't actually seen a nebulized complication, uh, um, but uh, in the literature, but, but again, without good randomization, so I, I should just focus on what our experience is. Um, so, but, but that was very consistent, and that's what we expected. In addition, across the cohort, um, there were no significant differences with phage and placebo um, in terms of um, exacerbations or AEs, and I'm just showing you here um, the, uh, um, the exacerbations, uh, pulmonary exacerbations, uh, which were defined as uh, classically for, for clinical trials. Um, 
The bacterial CFUs uh, was also ne um, negative here. So the uh, change from um, baseline screen to day 14 had no difference between the groups. What I'm showing you here on the right is our placebo compared to phage. So placebo's in red, phage's in blue. So you can see we're starting with a higher CFU, uh, um, um, but there's no significant change across this particular time point. What was interesting is um, we can follow the, the patients out uh, uh, over time. You can see here again, placebo's in red, uh, phages in blue. Um, it, the trajectories of, of the CFUs are, are interesting. I'm highlighting for you the patient in the placebo group who um, came from out of state to Connecticut and anecdotally said, I love Connecticut, um, which we like, but um, uh, and felt great. But you can see here from a clinical trial perspective, went from 10 to the 10 10 CFUs down to uh, 10 to the 7, so a three log reduction in the placebo group essentially made it impossible for uh, phage effect here to, uh, in, in the other population, to be uh, uh, significant in this small uh, cohort. There was also no change in, in lung function um, over, over the cohort. And so, um, just to give a, a snapshot at this point in the interest of time, we've got nebulized phage therapy for Pseudomonas in a in f, uh, small cohort of patients. Nebulization is safe. There were no complications o over time in terms of differences between uh, um, uh, from a safety signal. Um, we obviously did not have any change in the bacterial CFUs. I think what's um, interesting here is um, uh, there are a variety of kind of take homes and do sputum worked very well in, in this group, group of patients. I think differences in our study compared to the other phase studies is we did not set the floor for Pseudomonas. So, um, so we had um, uh, you know, a lower Pseudomonas in the phage intervention group. Um, and so uh, uh, potentially seeing uh, 10 to the fifth on average go down to 10 to the fourth may not be um, uh, uh, as uh, clinically meaningful. Um, we do have some additional analysis that's ongoing, uh, and the evolutionary trade-off would at least support the hypothesis that this strategy could help with other uh, targets of inflammation and other things that, it, um, that we're looking at so that the possibility of longitudinal treatment is still uh, a consideration. And we're obviously looking at uh, antibody production and, um, and the response to phage. Um, and then just for folks that are interested in, in this field, uh, we, I've just shown you here GMP production results for our phage titers, and you can see they fluctuate over time. Um, and so this was really hard for me personally because we had an open label uh, uh, component to this trial. So with these fluctuations, as you can see here, I had to consider and I did close the trial in order to make sure that we had phage for our open label patients, but then to see that the phage titers actually increased, which um, uh, is um, impossible from a phage survival perspective. So just shows that this, we, we still have to go after uh, some of the issues for GMP. So in the interest of time, I'll just say um, I want to thank uh, my colleagues at our Center for Phage Biology and Therapy, our subjects who uh, who enrolled. Uh, this uh, For anyone interested, that this is um, uh, a study that really was advanced with the collaboration with the CF Foundation's Clinical Research Scholars Program. They gave me great feedback in, in trial design, and, um, and, and so that was a fantastic experience. And we also received funding from Yale. And um, so I'll say thank you and take any questions. All right, this is now open for discussion. Any questions from the audience? Thank you, John. Wonderful presentation. I'm John Bradley, uh, Pediatric Infectious Diseases from San Diego. And, um, and as you present these data and as you are obviously involved in other clinical trials, um, as we put together pediatric clinical trials with Andrea Hahn, uh, one of the problems that's really facing us is the development of resistance on treatment. And the parallels with antibiotic therapy are, are pretty spectacular. And phage have been killing uh, bacteria for a million years. So as you know, there's multiple mechanisms of resistance. When we treated our child with a chromobacter, we promised the FDA that we would get cultures looking for phages every other day, looking for resistance. And if we found it in a phage, we'd replace it with another active phage. 
but it's really hard and time consuming to, to culture out the phages and then see if they're resistant. And, and unfortunately fortunately for the child, there wasn't resistance, but yeah. unfortunately we got our first resistance result after the complete two week treatment course was done. How do you track resistance in someone who's getting phages to know that the phage may no longer be effective? Yeah, uh, so that's a great question. And um, in our patients that we're treating longitudinally, our strategy is actually to force resistance. Um, so we want to see that effect. And, um, and so we're selecting, so this is not, well, we will have that data for this clinical trial, but I'm moving back to the compassionate cases to answer your question. And so, um, so the, I guess, so, so that's the, so that's our first approach, right? Is that we're trying to push for resistance. And I think two interesting things that you brought up. Number one is, um, do you find phage in the sputum? And, and I, and I think the question about that is, does it help you determine your pharmacokinetics, which we've obviously discussed? And so one approach would be if you see the phage and the phage is continuing to be effective against the bacteria, that's a good signal. But the other way to think about that is maybe that's too much phage in the system and you don't need that high a dose in order for that effect to occur because you're just leaving a phage in a system where the bacteria will continue to be resistant. And so what you're bringing up is, is um, a, a food for a long discussion, right, about pharmacokinetics and what your therapeutic approach is. Um, I think it's great to see that, that we can measure phages in sputum. And I think in, uh, whenever we have the sputum, we want to do that. But I'm not convinced that it's telling you what we, I'm not convinced we know what it's meaningful for in terms of the uh, effects in the lung, uh, if, if, if that is at all helpful. It's very, yeah. very helpful. It's, nobody knows yeah. with most of these questions. Thank you. And I think the other caveat to that is, is you know, animal modeling is not going to be an effective system to look to look at that. Um, and so uh, uh, for a variety of reasons in terms of the kinetics and having a good animal model. So we have a lot of work to, to do to figure out what uh, how to do that. Yes. Hi, I'm Jacob, uh, pediatric pulmonologist from Switzerland. I'm not an expert in phage therapy, so maybe my question is known by anybody, everybody here in the audience except me. I was just wondering, in the initial slide, or when you showed the exclusion criteria of the study, all those with some allergies, like food allergies, you excluded. So oh. I was wondering, is this just a safety thing, or yeah. is the therapy not applicable for any? No, it was, uh, we actually just were, it was a, a anaphylaxis to soy because there's a soy product in the prep. So we just wanted to exclude that. Uh, but the allergy was, and it was severe allergy to soy. So it's a great question that you're bringing up. There were actually some other allergies, food allergies, or food foods listed at least on your list. Y yeah. It, 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 was yeah, it was, it was really a precaution here, but the, but, uh, but you bring up a really good point. The criteria was uh, anaphylaxis, yeah. A, a related question from the chat is how many potential participants were excluded because their pseudomonas was not susceptible? Uh, yeah, so the part of the problem from um, uh, how this worked within the pandemic is that we had, um, we only had uh, 10, sorry, we had 15 patients come in for, for screening. So of those, eight patients were, um, were uh, susceptible, but we did actually screen additional patients with uh, um, looking at pseudomonas in our, in our panel. And we did find that um, we had some patients who could be considered based upon our experience with using these phages. But because of the pandemic, we actually couldn't bring them in for actual screening. So so it was 15 went to um, went to eight um, uh, with um, uh, yes yeah. Hi John, uh, Katie Wetzel, University of Pittsburgh. Um, great talk, thanks. Um, I was just wondering, you know, comparing the the first batch of compassionate use patients compared to the patients enrolled in the trial, were there you know right very different circumstances? So were there um, sort of differences that stuck out in terms of like? patient health or different measurements. You sort of touched on that with the CFU, but anything that sort of stuck out as to why some of the outcomes may have been different? Well, uh, yeah, so so um, probably 
in terms of patient characteristics, everybody in the initial cohort had failed uh, concomitant antibiotic therapy uh, or had just completed antibiotic therapy or were getting phage in the setting of antibiotic therapy. So it was very much in a it failed exacerbations or ongoing exacerbations. And so I think that's also an explanation for the higher CFUs. Um, but, but anecdotally, after modulator, we still have patients with structural lung disease who have high CFUs of MDR uh, uh, bacteria, and we've had an opportunity to also treat them with uh, inhaled phage. And we are seeing more of a delta in the, uh, more of a change in, in treatment effect from a CFU perspective. And so I think there, there may be um, a characteristic to how much uh, um, bacteria in, uh, you know, how much bacteria is adapting to the phage uh, that, that we're giving in that um, kind of more inflamed structural lung disease component compared to a relatively healthy, stable population? Yeah, great question. Thank you. This, uh, this study had, had four patients in, in each arm of it, which uh, you could say that, that perhaps it was underpowered to detect any, any differences. Yeah. How large of a study will you need in, in the future in order to detect a, a meaningful difference in yeah, it's titers. it's a great question. Um, to be to be honest with you, so we initially wanted to enroll um, um, uh, th uh, thirty two patients, right? Split yeah. between, uh, but um, our initial data had a two and a half log reduction in phage after a uh, bacterial CFU. So, so if you map out the two and a half log reduction, we just we needed ten patients, right? But that patient in the placebo group who had the drop would have also confounded that um, that observation. So, um, so it's actually a relatively small population to have a significant difference if we continue to see uh, that change. Um, and I, I found it interesting going back to Armada and to Biomics. They they created the floor of the above ten to the fifth, so it was ten to the sixth. And so we saw a log reduction from you know in the ten to the fifth there. But but the, um, uh, I think the way they designed it, they they anticipated this potentially, and so that also would uh, would would um, uh, you know potentially uh, affect your your total uh, patient population size. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Great, thanks everyone. Um, we will now hear from Dr. Simone Andreu from Imperial College of London. She's going to speak to us about screening for fungal infections. We're very excited with this uh, session today that we're covering, um, we're covering all kinds of different pathogens ranging from uh, pseudomonas to fungus, gram-positives, gram-negatives. <laughs> And we are very excited to hear your talk about um, galactamana and screening for fungal infections. Thank you very much um, to all of you for coming to such an early session and also to the organizers and the chairs uh, for giving me the opportunity to present my research. Um, just to say that I am a pulmonologist, as you say, here in the uh, US, uh, or a respiratory, pediatric respiratory physician uh, in London. And I'm currently undertaking research uh, with Professor Jane uh, Davies and uh, Dr. Andrew Jones at Imperial College and the Brompton. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about Spidium galaxomana and uh, its visibility as a screening test for Aspergillus infection in pediatric cystic fibrosis patients. Let's see if you have to click on the uh, this on one the presentation. Uh, all this maybe. Yes. Um, so I have uh, no disclosures to uh, make. Um, and then a little bit of introduction. I think we've heard over the last few days in the conference um, the extent of lung disease and, and uh, infection that accounts for most of its morbidity and mortality in cystic fibrosis patients. And yet I'm coming here to add another um, pathogen in the list of uh, bags. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Aspergillus, and we know that it exists everywhere around us in the environment. Um, and depending on the host genetic susceptibility and immunity, Aspergillus fumigatus can cause significant disease 
it can vary from uh, saprophytic, like an aspergilloma, um, from invasive, uh, like in you know compromised patients, uh, allergic, um, allergic mediated asthma, uh, or um, allergic bronchitis bronchopulmonary uh, aspergillosis that we do get to see in cystified process patients and uh, chronic uh, aspergillus bronchitis. Also important to mention here is that the prevalence of aspergillus fumigatus in CF patients in literature is recorded between 11 and 58 percent. And the reason for this variability, we believe, is because of the difficulty to detect and diagnose aspergillus infection. Um, therefore, early infection is uh, crucial uh, to initiate treatment and potentially prevent uh, tre uh, damage, lung damage. So what is galactomannan? Galactomannan is a polysaccharide antigen that exists primarily in the cell walls of Aspergillus species. And it may be released into the blood and other bodily fluids even in the early stages of Aspergillus invasion and its presence can be sustained for many weeks. Um, it has been used primarily uh, in, uh, serum lavage, in serum or bronchiolar lavage, and there have been studies in Spidium galactomannan which have shown higher sensitivity um, and rap more rapid turnaround uh, compared to fungal culture. Um, I would like to uh, point your attention to uh, columns three and four here. And this is findings from current literature. Um, I think it is important uh, to uh, mention here that first, um, there is only one um, study by Baxter et al. that is only done in Spirium galactoman and in cystic fibrosis patients. And the other one is that is there's no studies at all in pediatric CF patients. So really the utility in the pediatric CF population of galactomannan, spirum galactomannan is unknown. Oops. So uh, our hypothesis is that spirum galactomannan can detect aspergillus infection even when cultures are negative and shorten time to treatment compared to culture. So um, we looked at 718 galactomana samples collected from December 2019 to September 2022. We excluded any patient that was not a pediatric patient over 18 years, not cystic fibrosis, um, any uh, samples that were galactomana not in sputum, and any insufficient problems, uh, insufficient samples or inconclusive results. So. Um, in total, we had uh, 550 galactomana samples from 161 pediatric cystic fibrosis patients. So uh, we looked at the number of samples by age group and we were able to show that most of the patients fall into the group of 11 to 17 years. Uh, and that's actually recorded higher instances in the coordinates in older children. Uh, but also this is potentially the children that are able to produce sputum. So uh, we divided our cohort into four uh, groups. The first group was a BPA group, which was a clinical diagnosis according to our Bromto uh, guidelines. The second group was uh, aspergillus infection with a positive culture at time zero. The third group was a suspected aspergillus infection that we treated, uh, but within the six months following that had a positive culture. And the last group was our control that had no history of aspergillus of APPA and no AF growth. Uh, and that was for two years before and after um, the sample. So our results, uh, we really wanted to see first, is this actually uh, a good test? And can we get results quickly? Um, so we're able to show a significant difference in the time reporting uh, with a median of four days for galactomannan and a uh, median for eight days for the culture. I want to point here, though, that the range for the culture could range between 5 to 48 days. So this definitely could delay treatment um, and affect outcome. 
So then we moved on to look at how the galactomannan levels um, in our sort of clinical groups related to our control group. And can we actually uh, use these as detecting galact um, aspergillus infection? And we were able to show a significant difference in the galactomannan level between all our clinical, uh, clinical groups and control group. We also moved on to look at some confounding factors that could affect our galactomannan levels. And there has been in the literature false positive results uh, reported with galactomannan um, for uh, other fungi, as they can detect the same epitope on the assay. Um, but we're able to show that although the other fungi, um, this uh, samples from our control group that had other fungi, um, showed a slightly raised galactomannan, but significantly different to the ones that the culture was positive. We also looked at the beta-lactam effect in our control group um, and looking at patients on beta, of the galactomana level that were on beta-lactam and patients that they were on beta-lactam and there was no significant difference. So then we moved on to see, could we use this uh, test as and able to monitor the disease progression um, so, first of all, we looked at the galactomana level before and after antifungal uh, therapy, and we were again able to show a significant difference uh, in the level pre and post. Um, and then we looked at the uh, lung function at the same time, and again, uh, this was able to show a significant improvement. Um, also, just to mention that some of the uh, patients that did not show improvement, uh, we were able to look at them closely, separately, individually, and some of them were persistent to have a positive uh, fungal culture, which explained uh, the persistent raised galactomannan level, uh, but not all of them. So. Um, Moving on, uh, we wanted to really decide what would be the ideal galactomannan cutoff uh, level for our patients. And again, just to say that there has been no pediatric study, so we didn't have anything to go by. The study that was we could use as an exemplar was the Baxter study in 2013, uh, which was the one that it was done only on CF patients. Um, and the level they used there was 0 0.5. So looking at our, um, oops, sorry about that. Um, so looking at our data, 51% um, had a galactomannan of more than 0 0.5, which was considered as reactive. So then we wanted to look the galactomannan sensitivity and specificity at that level. So first of all, we looked at the sensitivity uh, of the aspirin galactomannan in the AF treated, and we were able to show um, sensitivity of 87% at the 0 0.5 galactomannan cutoff. Um, moving on, we looked at the specificity in the control group, uh, and this was 64% at the 0 0.5 uh, galactomannan cutoff. So moving on, we wanted to see, is there a better, an optimal galactomannan cutoff um, that we could establish? So we performed further rock curve analysis and we're able to show that a galactomannan level of 1.866, uh, there was a sensitivity of 83 and a specificity of 85%. At this point, I want you to remind you of this table of the current literature and just draw your attention to the Kalakman and cutoff level reported. And you can see the white variability at the cutoffs. And I think important here to say is that the last two studies were the ones more relevant to our a cohort uh, because they were in CF patients. Again, no pediatric patients, and they definitely used the same immunoassay. So it was quite relevant to us. But again, no pediatric. So I don't think that this is uh, a definite result for us and that we can correlate so well with them. So um, just to uh, conclude and summarize, um, this is the first pediatric uh, study in Spirum galactomana, as far as we know. Um, definitely Spirum galactomana does show a promise as a biomarker. Um, I think we were able to demonstrate a different cutoff for galactomannan than adult studies. Um, 
one of our major limitations was that the incidence of the Aspergillus uh, positive cultures in our study was uh, lower than recorded in the literature for pediatric and adults. Uh, Again, you have to take into consideration that at the time it was COVID-19, uh, people were home and isolating, um, and also um, um, modulators were started, so maybe less sputum production. So therefore, uh, we believe to confirm and validate our findings, we need larger studies that would demonstrate an optimal cutoff for galactomannan in children with cystic fibro fibrosis. The other thing that we are anticipating will come as a question is that we have less and less sputum. So of course we thought of that and this is part of a bigger study uh, looking into different biomarkers and different ways to uh, sample um, the airways. Um, so we hopefully that this could translate potentially into our other uh, samples. Um, so uh, finishing off, of course, I want to um, thank my amazing supervisors, um, especially Professor Jane Davies, um, Chiara, uh, our colleague from Italy that we collaborated and she did very hard work, um, and the rest of the support team that Chris is here as well and our team supporting me uh, throughout this. Um, so yeah, thank you. Morning, Jacob again from Switzerland. Uh, thank Hello. you so much for the nice presentation, very interesting. Um, one observation I had, I was wondering that you have so much sputum in your children. I mean, you had more than 500 samples, so I was really... Yeah, obviously it's over three uh, years, you know. So, um, yes, I think we do a lot of induced sputum in the department as well. Okay. Um, and if you, you have to consider that we are, we are one of the biggest uh, centres, the biggest in UK and one of the biggest in Europe. So, yeah, yes, we do have a high population. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel small now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it wasn't intentional and not personal. <laughs> Be I'm, kind. I'm not Swiss, so that's okay. Um, sorry, there's one other question. Some of course. Not a methodological question. So you did mm. this in sputum now, and we know, as you said, that sputum production goes down. Mm. So how is it, I know, throat swap is not the same as sputum, but could this methodology be done also in a swap from the throat? I think it could be done, but I think the one thing we have to again think about is, is that a different cutoff of galactomannan? Because, for example, in some of the papers that they were looking at invasive disease, they would get a much higher galactomannan. Um, then, I don't know, will be a lower, much lower detection of galactomannan? I'm not sure. Uh, till we look into it, I will, won't be able to answer that question. But yeah, definitely we'll be thinking about it. So maybe if you do it, let me know, then we do the same. So yeah, we can collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> then you feel big. <laughs> I, I think that uh, you really identified an issue here that um, fungal cultures take a long time to come back. And by the time they do, the patient is, is you know, maybe out of sight and out of mind for us. And the galactomannan could sort of uh, be combined with with uh, with treatment, like like mm -hmm. you were like you were showing. So um, I want to hear a little bit more about uh, the decision to treat uh, in in these patients. So you were reflexively treating um, some of them based on the positive results mm -hmm. and seeing improvements in lung function. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, of course. So if you can see, we separated our patients into sort of three um, sort of groups that can go back into them. Um, um, but yeah, so basically it was not always just a, a decision on, uh, because some of the patients were negative, but we still treated mm -hmm. um, because we were uh, really suspicious and a lot of these patients at the same uh, time had admissions for IV antibiotics because they were not uh, well. Um, so a lot of them were started treatment before they had a positive culture, but actually a lot, the second group, the suspected EF infection, within six months they did have a positive culture. Um, we had the AF infection, which was very clear clinically, and we had a positive culture. And then we had the ABPA uh, diagnosis, which is quite difficult, and potentially there may be an overlap, an overlap in the AF negative culture there. Yeah. So um, 
and we followed our guidelines, the Brompton guidelines, which they're widely used. Um, so we use sort of um, the clinical status of the patient. Uh, we use um, their lung function, their hematological ABPA markers. So it was a combination of decision and of course a senior clinician making that decision to start treatment. Um, so it was a very easy and actually that was the hardest part of our study to decide and try to have clean groups um, so we can analyze. Another observation I made is is that the lung function for these patients, some of it's quite low. Does that impact your pretest probability for this? You know, if someone has low lung function, mm -hmm. are you thinking it's more likely that I will identify fungus? And does that uh, change how you interpret a galactomannan result? Um, yeah, potentially it, it could affect your decision making. Like I'm trying to think as a scientist and as a clinician, but actually when you have a child that is not improving, that you've tried everything, you will try and treat. Um, but yeah, yes, potentially, yes. I cannot answer very clearly the question. I have um, one, uh, one comment or one question. Yeah, of um, course. Well. So one, I think um, given the the challenges that we're facing with reduc reduction in sputum production. I think doing looking for non-sputum-based biomarkers for things like fungus and NTM is super important. So hats off to, to you for doing this work. Um, but my my one question is, is did you have any concurrent radiographic data that you can look at with these different groups, for instance, to kind of say, you know, if the patient had an ABPA diagnosis, did they have a large mucus plug that was removed if, when you did therapy that could have accounted for some of those FEV1 changes? Or can that also help you to try to determine between a clinically significant aspergillus infection yeah. versus you know, just a colonization? Yeah, um, that's an interesting uh, question. And uh, for a lot of this ABPA uh, group, um, L we will have we will have had X-ray and LCI, but I haven't actually looked into it into further detail. But it's definitely something very worth looking at. Yeah, great suggestion. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Andrea. Great. Thank you. Okay, and next up, we are going to have um, Mahmoud Ahmad, who is coming to speak to us about the changing face of pediatric pulmonary exacerbations in CF. Uh, Mahmoud is a third year medical student at the University of Colorado, so we're very excited to have him come here and have the opportunity to speak today and sure share his group's work. This box. Perfect, thank you. Turn on the laser real quick. Perfect. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> I feel I should have this much power as a medical student, so <laughs> I'm going to take my sweet time with this. Um, uh, I just want to begin by saying uh, thank you to the organizer of this workshop uh, for the invitation and opportunity uh, to present findings from our study. Uh, I have two disclosures. Uh, the first is that I'm grateful for the CF Foundation, um, who had funded uh, my work with a student traineeship award. And the second is a kind of a disclaimer, um, is that I'm now a third year medical student at the University of Colorado. And when I started this project, um, I knew very, very little about CF and even less about pulmonary exacerbation. And it's been very excited uh, to learn about both while participating uh, in this project. As uh, many of you are aware, uh, people with cystic fibrosis often uh, suffer from acute pulmonary exacerbation requiring hospitalization and IV antibiotics. Uh, these exacerbations historically were important uh, drivers of long-term decline in lung health, quality of life, and life expectancy. These data from, uh, from this US CFF patient registry um, for many years up through 2019, uh, the proportion of people with cystic fibrosis were treated with IV antibiotics for pulmonary exacerbation relatively uh, stable, uh, despite improvement with uh, despite improvement in lung function and nutritional status, and over the uh, over the same time frame, two major developments. Uh, 
led to a remarkable decrease in the number of reported exacerbation in 2020-2021. First was the approval of uh, ETI therapy in late 2019 for people with cystic fibrosis uh, 12 years and older. Uh, and then second was uh, the COVID-19 pandemic with less exposure um, to viruses being a likely contributing factor. ETI therapy was then uh, approved to six years of age in 2021. As COVID restriction relaxed, uh, we saw a surge of children being hospitalized for various different viruses, including RSV influenza in 2022. Yet a sharp rebound in hospitalization among children with cystic fibrosis was not observed in 2022. We wondered whether the demographic and clinical profiles of children with cystic fibrosis being hospitalized for exacerbation in 2022 differed uh, from those admitted in 2018 before the approval of ETI therapy and before uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We hypothesized uh, that a higher percentage uh, of those who were hospitalized in 2022 did not qualify for ETI therapy due to having two non f 508 del mutations uh, compared to those who required hospitalization in 2018. Our primary uh, study objective was to determine uh, the demographic and clinical characteristics of children with cystic fibrosis who are not requiring hospitalization for pulmonary exacerbation. Um, so the study methods uh, include data from all children at five different pediatric US sites were captured from the CFF patient registry and by manual chart review. This data collected, we, the data we collected included demographics information, including age, race, uh, CFTR, genotypes, um, admission information, including number of days growth uh, measures and PFTs, a comprehensive uh, microbiology information, including respiratory culture um, and respiratory uh, sample type. And then finally, what inpatient medications were prescribed, including um, IV oral inhaled antibiotics and systemic steroids. Uh, for children with multiple, uh, multiple, uh, with multiple emissions in a given year, fixed data such as demographic data were only counted uh, once. I did not realize how dry Phoenix is. My mouth is <laughs> drying up fast. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I really like this slide. Um, as I mentioned, this data collection occurred at five pediatrics uh, site across the US. I'd like to thank uh, the investigators at Children's National Hospital in Washington, DC, Radies Children's Hospital in San Diego, Children's Hospital of Orange County, and Seattle Children's for the collaboration and for the rigor of data collection. Let's, like, let's take a look at our main results. Uh, on the figure on the left, um, across five different pediatric sites, uh, the number of hospitalizations for pulmonary exacerbation decreased from 468 to 162 in 2022, which was an over 60% uh, reduction. And then the figure on the right, uh, children were more likely to be hospitalized more than once in 2018 compared to 2022. The figures on this slide and the next slide display core demographics, uh, features of children who were hospitalized in 2018 and 2022. There were not age differences nor sex differences uh, between 2018 and 2022 uh, based from the data we collected. However, uh, there were racial differences and a, a trend towards ethnic differences between hospitalized in 2018 and 2022. So on the figure on the left, um, a higher percentage of those hospitalized in 2022 identified as black or as mixed or other races compared with um, 2018. And the figure on the right also, uh, there was a trend towards higher percentage of people identified as Hispanic um, requiring hospitalization in 2022 compared to uh, 2018. 
As we hypothesized, children hospitalized in 2022 were more likely to have two non-F508 DEL mutations compared with children hospitalized in 2018, uh, the 38% compared to the 19%. Transitioning from demographics to clinical profiles of children hospitalized uh, in 2022, we are looking at uh, changes in lung function with IV antibiotic treatments. Uh, and 2018 is uh, color coded in purple, uh, and 2022 is color coded in uh, yellow. So, baseline FEV1 percent predicted uh, is the average of up to six months of FEV1 uh, measurements prior to emission and discharge. FEV1 is the FEV1 at discharge or within 30 days of discharge. The results came uh, uh, demonstrated trends towards ba uh, better baseline lung function among those hospitalized in 2022 versus 2018. But there was no differences. Uh, there's no difference in the percentage of uh, improvement in FEV1 between those hospitalized in 2018. Uh, and those hospitalized in 2022. And no difference in proportion of individuals who returned to within 90% uh, or 100% of baseline uh, percent predicted FEV1. To quickly highlight some of our other key study findings, um, lengths of hospitalization were similar in 2018 and 2022. Um, there were no difference uh, and percentage of those hospitalized who were infected with pseudomonas and MSSA uh, between the two time periods. Um, however, there was a significantly lower percentage of children hospitalized in 2022 who were infected with MRSA compared to those hospitalized in 2018. Um, and a higher percentage of hospitalized children in 2022 uh, were on CFTR modulator uh, therapy, including about a third on ETI than in 2018. It's important to mention limitations of our studies. Um, practice patterns in terms of diagnosis and treatments of our uh, of pulmonary exacerbation were not standardized across five uh, the five sites. Uh, and due to retrospective design, uh, we did not have adherence data particularly related to those prescribed CFTR modulated therapy, including ETI, nor measures of mental and social health among those hospitalized during these two years. In conclusion, um, landscape of pediatric pulmonary exacerbation is changing. Reduction in hospitalization likely reflects the benefit of ETI therapy as a higher percentage of children hospitalized in 2022 had two non-F508 DEL mutations and were not elig eligible for ETI, and higher percentage of those hospitalized in, 20 to in 2022 identified as being from minority and racial uh, minority racial backgrounds, um, further highlighting important health equities efforts in CF. Lower percentage of children hospitalized in 2022 were infected with MRSA concurrent with decreased rates of MRSA community, community infections in 2022. And these data points to changing uh, risk factors for hospitalization among children with CF and consideration of novel treatment strategies to improve outcomes uh, of exacerbation treatment for hospitalized children who do not qualify for ETI therapy. So I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Sagal, sitting up in the front supporting me, <laughs> and his uh, colleagues at Children's uh, Hospital Colorado and his collaborators at Children's National Hospital, uh, Children's Hospital LA, uh, Radiate Children's Hospital, Children's Hospital Orange County, and Seattle Children's. I'll, I'll be happy to listen to your questions and we'll do my best to answer it. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure Dr. Sagal will be taking notes and reviewing these questions with me following the session. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to be bragging to my classmates to this. <laughs> really nice work and, and really well presented. Thank you. Um, thank you.
Um, so just wondering, can the difference in hospitalizations in the uh, ethnic and racial minorities be explained by the difference in eligibility for ETI? There's, uh, my understanding is that, you know, that, that fewer of um, African-American and uh, uh, Hispanic are eligible. So the difference in admissions in, in, in those groups and the difference in admission um, in, in people on ETI, um, are they related? Yeah, um, I had that same question at the post my poster session. Um, I don't have the data for specific the genotypes for every ethnic group, um, but I learned recently that um, people who identify as black or Hispanic and others um, express not more uh, more frequently non F five hundred eight DELs, so they probably are less uh, approved for ETI therapy. And there's also some other possible social aspects with uh, not being offered or um, access. So um, short answers, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, Yasmin Hilliam from Dartmouth. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you don't, you observe fewer children being hospitalized with MRSA and that's concurrent with lower levels of community infection with MRSA. Does that include um, like low, lower rates of MRSA colonization in these children, do you know? Or is it just as in, in the wider community, there are lower levels of like MRSA infection observed? I'm not 100% sure on that one, yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. We, we only looked at the data yeah. during admission, so there are admission cultures. It's a, it's a great question. We don't yeah. know the answer to that. It's okay. Yeah. I would comment that I think that seems to be real in, in my experience that there is a slow receding of some MRSA lineages in the cystic fibrosis population and a rise in some MSSA lineages. Um, uh, one thing that uh, is it, sort of interesting about this, you have the you have the data on which drugs they received. Have you seen declines in vancomycin use in, um, in this population? Another great question, the, the microbiology, the uh, antibiotic piece, and it was presented by a few of our infectious disease oh, okay. colleagues at, at ID Week in, in the last week. There, there wasn't significant changes as far as I'm aware at this point uh, uh, in, you know, in, in different antibiotics prescribed. There's certainly quite a few differences across sites, how we prescribe, oh, you know, okay. some do prescribe banks, some don't prescribe banks. But I'm not sure we saw big differences in, in overall trends in that regard. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yes, Sam. Hi, uh, Sam Durfee, University of Washington. First Hi. of all, great talk. Thank you. Um, second, I was wondering if you're planning on doing a subgroup analysis on your lung function changes between pe the kids on ETI and not on ETI to see if the kids not on ETI have a lower response potentially. I believe that's our further studies yes okay, yeah great. Sorry if you mentioned that. no 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 i don't think it was on the slides yeah okay, yeah but great. yeah Thank you. yeah uh mike powers from portland i wanted to congratulate scott um, <laughs> yeah. involving medical students is what we need to do in our community to expand our community so thank yeah. you, Scott. Yeah, thank you. And um, I had a question. Um, I'm always curious how many people get back to 90% of their baseline. Do you, do you I think, recall, I couldn't quite catch that on the figure. Yeah. We didn't show it on yeah. this. Um, uh, it, it, was, it was over 80%. I can't remember. It was somewhere between 85 to 90%. So that's within 90%. That's okay. really good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Did you happen to look at um, in your in the registry data, what percentage of the, the, you know, two non F508 mutations, what percentage of those were uncharacterized or unknown? You know, just kind of also thinking that, you know, minorities, people of color, um, you know, have more rare mutations that may not come up on, depending what kind of screening everybody's doing. Right. Um, it's a great question. And it also relates to Jordan's question too. You know, we have, uh, I, I will say that we have, the, you know, we have the defined mutations for almost everybody uh, in this cohort. We haven't looked carefully at, um, uh, you know, those who, you know, especially related to Jordan's question, we haven't looked carefully at those, you know, um, who are being hospitalized uh, in terms of differences in genetic background uh, uh, um, and ETI eligibility. I suspect we're going to find 
that's the case, that you know, those being hospitalized, again, we know that they're more likely to have two of non F five weights, and I suspect it's gonna be related to their racial and ethnic background right. as well. On there. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Really, really great job. That was wonderful talk. Um, we will now hear from uh, uh, Dr. Bailey Horn from Augusta University in Georgia, who's going to describe another uh, changing aspect of cystic fibrosis care. Uh, the discontinuation of anti pseudomonal suppression therapy uh, in patients who uh, are no longer so affected by pseudomonas. You can't use theirs. Yeah, that will be your best bet. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you so much for that warm introduction and the invitation to speak. Um, this is my previous year's research project as a first year pharmacy resident on the discontinuation of inhaled anti pseudomonal suppressive therapy in patients with cystic fibrosis. I would like to say neither myself nor anybody on my study team has anything to disclose for this presentation. For a little bit of background, which I'm sure you guys are a lot more well versed than I was when I first started this project, we know that um, cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder that affects over 40,000 adults and children in the United States. And that this is characterized by mutation in the CFTR protein and that patients with cystic fibrosis are at an increased risk of developing a pulmonary exacerbation due to infections caused by bacterial pathogens and are often placed on either eradication or suppressive therapy. Current literature states that many bacteria, but most notably Pseudomonas, um, are extremely pathogenic and result in significant lung damage. Um, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation provides recommendations on how to manage these initial infections with eradication therapy and how to manage colonization with suppressive therapy. However, there's no formal guidance on follow-up on how to potentially de-escalate therapy or even discontinue therapy. So the rationale for this study is that current literature really supports that pseudomonas infections can lead to decreased lung function, increased hospitalizations, diminished quality of life for our patients, and increased morbidity and mortality. And if we were to continue um, suppressive therapy indefinitely, it's not only um, per allowing for increased antimicrobial resistance, but can create a lot of burden for the patient and the healthcare system. So the purpose of this study was to determine if the discontinuation of inhaled anti pseudomonal suppressive therapy for patients with cystic fibrosis would impact the incidence of pseudomonas aeruginosa regrowth and their lung function. For this study, um, it was performed at a single academic medical center and we looked at prospective intervention with retrospective data collection. The inclusion criteria, our patients had to meet our institution's policy for the inhaled anti pseudomonal de escalation guideline. So, they were all cystic fibrosis patients who fell into one of these three groups. They had to either be pseudomonas aeruginosa culture negative for at least two years, or the patient was on continuous suppressive antibiotic therapy and stable on a CFTR modulator for at least three months and had to at least be pseudomonas culture negative for six months or patients were on continuous suppressive antibiotic therapy and stable on a CFTR modulator for three months who could have been PSA culture positive, but hasn't had a pulmonary exacerbation in the past six months. And all of this was decided amongst our adult and pediatric pulmonologists, and this was just how our institution managed it. Unfortunately, we didn't meet power, so our statistical analysis was mostly descriptive statistics for our primary and secondary outcomes. Taking a closer look at our institution's inhaled anti pseudomonal de escalation guideline, these are these three groups that I mentioned on the previous slide. So, on the left hand side, you can see um, patients who are pseudomonas culture negative for at least two years were able to stop all inhaled anti pseudomonal therapy. However, our patients that were on cycled, or sorry, continuous suppressive antibiotic therapy and a CFTR modulator who were either PSA culture negative or PSA culture positive without a pulmonary exacerbation, they were able to stop one of their inhaled anti-pseudomonal agents and continued on um, 
CAT or the cycled antibiotic therapy. So they would just do monotherapy for 28 days on and 28 days off. And then at that point, if they remained pseudomonas culture negative for two years, we were able to stop all inhaled anti-pseudomonal therapy. We were able to obtain quarterly cultures for our patients to assess how they were responding. And so these cultures were either throat swabs or sputum cultures. Um, if the repeat cultures remain negative for P um, pseudomonas, we were discontinuing therapy. However, if they experienced pseudomonas regrowth, um, it was up to the, the physician discretion at, to either initiate a 28-day eradication course or reinitiate um, cycled antibiotic therapy. If they were experiencing a pulmonary exacerbation at a clinic visit, again, it was up to the provider discretion on whether to do another um, addition of systemic antimicrobial therapy for eradication or reinitiate the cycled antibiotic therapy. Looking at our primary outcome, it was to assess the pseudomonas culture response upon discontinuation of therapy. And our secondary outcomes, we assessed change in lung function, which we assessed by FEV1, and the incidence and management of pulmonary exacerbations. For our demographic data, it was pretty standard. We also assessed um, their FEV1 at the time of de-escalation of therapy, if they were on a CFTR modulator, and also the phenotype of their pseudomonas. And then for our outcomes, we assessed um, which bacterial organisms were grown on their respiratory cultures, the time from discontinuation to bacterial regrowth and or pulmonary exacerbation if it occurred. Um, how were their pulmonary exacerbations treated, and then their change in FEV1 from the time of de-escalation of therapy. Taking a quick look at our baseline demographics, our median age was about 15 years old. We did include both adults and pediatrics in our study, and then we had a pretty even split of male and female participants, and also um, the majority of our patients identified as white. I think a pretty impressive statistic is that almost 92% of our patients were on um, ETI, CFTR modulator therapy, and we had a relatively even split of mucoid and non-mucoid um, pseudomonas phenotypes with eight of those participants. Um, unfortunately, they were not documented, so it could not be reported. Looking at our primary outcome, we had 35 participants that were included, and at the time of discontinuation, the median FEV1 was 84.5 and consistently remained in the 80s to lower 90s with each repeat culture. But as you can see across the top, we did have a significant number of fall off but with each repeat culture, with only three participants having four repeat cultures from the time of de-escalation. And then looking at the top two rows, most notably the bacterial organisms um, the second row shows the pseudomonas. So at the time of discontinuation of inhaled anti-pseudomonal therapy, five patients were still growing pseudomonas, but this number did decrease with um, repeat cultures. Assessing our secondary outcomes, um, five of our 35 patients ended up regrowing pseudomonas after discontinuation of inhaled um, pseudomonal therapy. And it took approximately 158 days for um, these patients to regrow pseudomonas. However, I think a very impressive statistic is that even though only five regrew pseudomonas, 16 patients still experienced a pulmonary exacerbation, which at our institution we define as an FEV1 decline at, at least 5% with signs and symptoms, so cough, increased sputum production, and such. Um, it took approximately 145 days for our, period, or for our patients to experience a pulmonary exacerbation, and of the 16 that experienced a pulmonary exacerbation, 11 received oral antibiotics and 5 received IV antibiotic therapy. Taking a closer look at the five patients that regrew pseudomonas upon discontinuation of therapy, the first patient um, and the second patient were both adult patients that at the time of discontinuation of therapy, their respiratory cultures had grown MRSA, and both of them regrew pseudomonas with their first repeat culture. As you can see, the second patient continued to regrow pseudomonas. However, neither one experienced a pulmonary exacerbation, and none of them required systemic antibiotics and were not placed on eradication therapy. Our third patient was a pediatric patient that regrew pseudomonas on their third repeat culture, and they were continued on their um, cycled antibiotic therapy. 
Um, unfortunately, we were unable to obtain a 4-3P culture due to the time constraint of the study. Um, this patient did experience a pulmonary exacerbation prior to regrowing um, pseudomonas on their repeat culture, for which they received oral antibiotic therapy. Our fourth patient was also a pediatric patient, and due, um, since our respiratory cultures are sent out, we weren't able to obtain, it was a bad sample, and so we couldn't figure out what was grown at the time of discontinuation, unfortunately. But they did regrow pseudomonas on their second repeat culture, um, and they received a course of eradication therapy. The pulmonary exacerbation occurred after the patient regrew pseudomonas, um, for which they received um, oral antibiotic therapy. And then our fifth and final patient was a pediatric patient that regrew pseudomonas on their first repeat culture and did experience a pulmonary exacerbation during the time frame of regrowing pseudomonas. Um, of note, this patient was on CFTR modulator therapy, but did self-discontinue at this time due to perceived side effects without letting the medical team know, unfortunately. Um, this patient with further pulmonary exacerbation did receive IV antibiotic therapy. For our discussion, approximately 85% of our patients did not regrow pseudomonas um, upon discontinuation of our cycled inhaled anti-pseudomonal therapy. Um, this could have been that we truly did not regrow or maybe the cultures that were taken didn't really culture out pseudomonas. Um, that could have been a difference between using our throat swab versus sputum cultures based on what the patient was able to produce. And also, if you remember back, 92% of our patients were on ETI mod modulator therapy, and so maybe they weren't able to produce a good enough sputum culture. Also, um, if you remember back from one of our first tables, our patients did not experience a significant decline in their um, FEV1 and their respiratory function. Um, this could be due to bias, as you re may recall, that we did have a significant number of patients that fell off and we had transitioned to a lot of our adult patients to using telehealth visits if they remained stable and didn't require to come in. Um, and we also had a pretty small capture time for our study. It was only conducted over nine months. And I think another interesting statistic is that the incidence of pulmonary exacerbation was not only linked with pseudomonas regrowth. So this could have been due to other viral um, contacts. It, we weren't able to assess really their adherence to their airway clearance or their modulator therapy. Um, it could also be due to other notable organisms that we've seen in the literature, including MSSA, MRSA, Burkholderia, and such. So some of the limitations of this study, um, we did have a significant reduction in follow-up visits, so that would have been nice to have a little bit more robust data, and it was retrospective in design. And future directions, um, assessing a larger patient population, a longer follow-up duration, and even assessing if CFTR modulator really does impact and seeing what that impact is on culture clearance. In conclusion, we believe that the study adds to the growing literature in an area lacking evidence-based guidance on the management on, of inhaled anti-pseudomonal therapy in culture-negative patients. I would like to acknowledge both the pediatric and adult cystic fibrosis team at our institution, as well as our IRB board, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you, this is up, open for discussion. Hi, right, thank you. That was a lovely presentation. I'm Jane Davis from London. Um, two comments or questions, really. What, what's your view on sputum induction, as mentioned by Simone? It's, it's something that we do regularly in this context, where we hope we've eradicated, and we hope it's not still there, but we don't want to be fooled. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be 100% honest, I'm not sure what our institution's um, policy is on induced sputum. Um, I just know that we try for our patients to be able to produce sputum at their clinic visits, and if they are unable to produce it, then we usually transition to a throat swab. I think, I'm sure we're missing stuff, so it oh, does I... worry me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and the other comment really was, do you do any sort of typing or genetics on your pseudomonas isolates? Because, for example, the one that was grew on the third visit, do we know it's actually a recurrence of that infection, or might it be a new acquisition? Or have you got those banks and you could do that retrospectively? Um, I believe we would be able to go back and look at that data. Um, all of that is a send out lab. And so we're able to see what type of pseudomonas based on the phenotype that's reported out. So um, I believe Maybe we would be able to. I think. But yeah, I agree. That would definitely be something interesting to look at.
Thank you. Hi, Deanna Green from Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Uh, fantastic work, and I think this is addressing a question that many centers are actually uh, looking at, and as you mentioned, a limitation of the original guidelines because there was nothing about how to eradicate and then stop. Um, so our center did the same thing. Um, our problem is we realized after medication refill data that our patients had actually already stopped all of their cycles. <laughs> so I am wondering whether or not you have any information from medical medication refill history predating any of this because again I think all of us think we're ordering it that our patients are not using. <laughs> so based on that this was a retrospective design we did not collect that data but it, it was Anecdotally, I do remember a few patients that had self-discontinued just from the notes I had to read through. So I think that would definitely be an interesting aspect to continue looking forward. You can probably get it because all of the specialty pharmacies do keep their data for about two years. Okay. So you might be able to get it. That would be helpful. Thank you so much. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Jerome Fahrisen from uh, UCSD. A uh, question in regards to the ones who regrew the pseudomonas. Were they on two different uh, classes of uh, anti-chronic anti anti-pseudomonal agents, the ones that were previously before it. Mm -hmm. And secondly, um, the cultures themselves, the, the, the ones who regrew, did you notice that they're still growing the sort of multi-drug resistant uh, pseudomonas? So your first question on were they still on two inhaled anti-pseudomonal agents prior to discontinuation? No, were there the ones that regrew the pseudomonas mm -hmm. initially, were they on one anti-pseudomonal agent or were they on two anti-pseudomonal agents? Um, so sicker so, to some degree or less or just on one? From those, the five that regrew, from what I remember, only one of them was on two and had transitioned to one, but the other ones had only been on one agent and were stopped to zero agents. And then for the ones that regrew, if they were more multi-drug resistant, um, unfortunately, I can't recall at this time, it's been a minute since I've looked at the data, but that would definitely be something we did collect and would be able to go back and look at. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I I, uh, I think this is this is great because it provides perhaps the preliminary data needed for you know a simplify type study in the future for um, addressing this in a in a larger uh, um, multi-centered way. It gives you a, um, an idea of what what might be the effect. One thing I was noticing was you have um, I, I think five people who cultured pseudomonas again. And then maybe a larger number was at 16 who ended up having exacerbations over the same kind of time frame. Mm -hmm. And it, it could be that we just didn't detect pseudomonas, um, as Dr. Davies uh, mentioned. Um, or could it be that um, inhaled tobramycin or uh, um, these other inhaled uh, treatments are having effects independent of pseudomonas? So do you think that, that that's a possibility? Um, I think that could potentially be a possibility. Um, I don't know the true data behind that, but also I think something else that could have led to that that we weren't able to collect is really, were they adhering to their airway clearance to mm -hmm. begin with? Were they adhering to all their other agents? Um, what kind of sick contacts did they have? Those types of things. Unfortunately, we weren't able to collect all that data, but I do think that would be an interesting approach to assess if maybe these have a little bit, these agents have more of an impact maybe on like inflammation or something that maybe weren't aren't as aware of. Do we have any more questions in the chat? Um, while he's checking the chat, um, do you have any any data on concurrent use of chronic macrolide therapy in these same patients? I did not collect that data, unfortunately. It might also be something worth mm -hmm. looking at. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think this is really cool that you took the leap of faith in, in doing this. <laughs> and um, these are questions that our patients definitely ask us about. Um, and I'm always wondering about as well when I take care of patients. So thank you very much for sharing these awesome. data. Thank you so much. All right, and now we will move in to our last speaker, Dr. Joy Gibson, an infectious disease physician from the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, who will be presenting on extended interval dosing of amikacin against mycobacterium abscessus, reducing efficacy in vitro. So make sure you're clicking on the box in order to advance. Okay. All 
All right. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Yes. So thank you very much to the organizers for the chance to talk to you about my work today. This is a bit of a shift from the other infection talks you've heard because it's really a pharmacology talk. Um, I'm a microbiologist, so <laughs> speaking about pharmacology, so um, I'll do my best to explain everything to you and happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, I have no disclosures. So I'll be talking to you today about treatment of Mycobacterium obsessus. You've already heard a lot about M. obsessus in these past couple of days, but just to review to make sure we're all on the same page, um, M. obsessus are a group of rapidly growing non-tuberculous mycobacteria that can infect and cause disease in people with CF. The recent registry data estimate the prevalence of NTM around 10% of people with CF, and M. obsessus are the second most common of these um, NTM that are isolated. Relative to other CF pathogens, these bacteria are particularly challenging to treat due to a high rate of intrinsic and acquired resistance. So this is just a very general diagram of a typical treatment regimen for M. obsessus. We use four or more antibiotics, at least two of which are IV for the first three months here. And then antibiotics are continued for a total of 15 months or often longer, with at least three antibiotics being given in combination throughout this regimen or throughout this time. This regimen carries a substantial risk of toxicity, and despite how intensive the therapy is, treatment still fails in over 50% of patients. So I believe that we can do better. Really, my lab is focused on examining ways that we can improve treatment success and also reduce the associated toxicity. So there are several potential ways that we could improve. One would be taking the antibiotics that we already have and improving the dosing strategies to be more successful. Another is examining which antibiotics are most synergistic with each other and coming up with the optimal combination of treatments. And yet another area for improvement is developing new treatments and many strategies you've already heard about in this conference. Um, I'm currently examining all three in my lab, but today I will talk to you about how we can improve on um, our dosing strategy. So back to what I showed you before with the M. obsessus sort of treatment regimen, there's really one medication that's an important backbone to M. obsessus treatment, and that's M. casein. We give it IV during the intensive phase of treatment and inhaled during the continuation phase. In fact, it's a major contributor to the toxicity risk, and um, it's associated with irreversible ototoxicity, which I think is kind of the feared outcome for many of us. We heard from a patient on Thursday, actually, that had lost his hearing due to amicacin treatment of M. obsessus, and this is something that we hear over and over again. So I wanted to ask if we can improve how we're using amicacin. So before I talk about amicacin, I mentioned this is a really a pharmacology talk, so I'm going to give some, um, define some very basic terms in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, which I'll refer to as PKPD from here on out. So one basic term that we use when we're looking at the response of bacteria to antibiotics is the minimum inhibitory concentration, or MIC, which I'm sure most of you have heard before, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, the MIC is determined by growing bacteria in the presence of serially diluted antibiotic. So we look at bacterial growth, and the MIC is the lowest concentrations, so that's what's shown here, where growth inhibition occurs. The MIC tells us about antibiotic potency, which means how much drug is needed to inhibit growth, but it doesn't really tell us about efficacy or how effective this will be in a patient. So to better define antibiotic response in a patient, we use three key indices of PKPD. All um, are comparing antibiotic concentration to the MIC. So what I'm showing you here is an antibiotic concentration profile over time in a patient. The first key index I'll talk about is peak to MIC. So this is comparing our peak antibiotic concentration, which would be here, um, to the MIC. Some medications are classified as what we call peak dependent. So the best predictor of outcome is peak to MIC ratio. These drugs typically have a long post-antibiotic effect due to an irreversible intracellular mechanism of action that allows inhibition to continue even after extracellular drug has been metabolized. So even after all of the drug is gone, because it's still having this intracellular effect, there's this post-antibiotic effect. 
So because of this, typically a higher dose is able to be given less frequently. And examples that are often used, particularly in CF, are amikacin and tobramycin. So the next PKPD index that I'll talk about is time above MIC. So for these drugs, what matters most is how long the antibiotic is above the MIC. So it's the time above the MIC. These drugs often do not have a post-antibiotic effect. And typically, these are cell wall active medications. For these antibiotics, we give a lower dose more frequently. Often for people with CF, probably many of you have used an extended infusion to maximize the time above MIC, particularly for beta-lactam antibiotics like cefepime and meropenem. And then the last category is AUC to MIC, or the area under the curve to MIC. AUC-dependent drugs are really somewhere kind of in between, so they have a low or moderate post-antibiotic effect, and we use a moderate dose and frequency. A common example of this is vancomycin. So let's talk more about amikacin specifically. I told you that amikacin is often used as an example as a peak-dependent medication. So why am I talking about it, right, if we already know this? Um, this, is, this is thought to be because it acts intracellularly, so this is my very um, poor attempt to draw a bacteria here, but um, <laughs> this is the um, activity on the 30S ribosome as depicted here. And it's been shown to have a prolonged post-antibiotic effect against typical gram-negative pathogens such as Pseudomonas. These findings in Pseudomonas, as well as the desire to reduce toxicity, um, have led to our current dosing recommendations for m of once daily amikacin or even three times weekly. But there really are minimal PKPD data with m to support this dosing recommendation. So my work described here seeks to define PKPD for m specifically. So to do that, I use a hollow fiber infection model to examine bacterial growth inhibition and development of resistance with a system that models human pharmacokinetics in vitro. So shown here is a schematic of the hollow fiber system. The hollow fiber cartridge is packed full of fibers. That's what's shown here in cross section. Um, they have a very small pore size that prevent bacteria from crossing the fibers. So within the cartridge is the extra capillary space, which has bacteria and antibiotic. And then the drug flows freely between the intracapillary space and the extra capillary space. And it's controlled by pumps in and out of the central reservoir where the drug concentration is regulated from. So we can model human antibiotic dosing using a syringe pump to precisely deliver um, a set drug concentration at a set frequency. So I have this, this um, antibiotic sort of feeding into the system. And then we can also control half-life by um, controlling the flow in and out of the system with media. So I can control the dose concentration, the um, frequency of the dose, and the half-life, just like you would see in a human, but in an in vitro model. So we used pediatric pharmacokinetic parameters for amikacin and matched 12 separate dosing regimens with a wide range of doses and frequency that are shown here. We inoculated a laboratory strain of imobsessus subspecies obsessus, and then sampled over 14 days. And we plated our samples both on standard media and amikacin-containing plates, and this allowed us to quantify both growth inhibition as well as the development of resistant organisms over time. So here I'm showing the growth curves for imobsessus in the hollow fiber system with amikacin. I summarized the data based on frequency of amikacin treatment, just because there are far too many growth curves to put all on one slide. Um, so control here is untreated. If it says less than 24 hours, that means the amikacin was given either continuously every eight hours or every 12 hours. And then if it's greater than 24 hours, amikacin was given either three times a week or every seven days. So growth curves are shown here on the left. And then I summarize the data on the right here as maximum delta CFU. Um, so this is sort of telling us what the maximum growth inhibition was. We found that more frequent dosing, so that's shown here, resulted in greater growth inhibition. Importantly, all conditions had initial growth inhibition, but it was followed by complete growth recovery. So you can see here there's no growth inhibition anymore at the end. And this was due to the development of resistance. So here I'm showing you growth curves of resistant organisms. So those are, are um, 
bacteria that grew out on our amicacin containing agar plates. So what you can see is that all of the populations were replaced with amicacin resistant organisms within 14 days. Um, however, more frequent dosing did delay the development of resistance, um, which I quantified on the right here as day of growth recovery. As you can see, with more frequent amicacin dosing, growth recovery due to resistance occurred around six to seven days, um, which was significantly longer than with less frequent dosing. Oh, I went ahead. Okay. Um, so to quantify which PKPD index, so time above MIC, AUC to MIC, or peak to MIC, fit the data best, we can plot the microbiologic outcome compared to PKPD indices and look for the best curve fit of a regression model. So first I'm showing you growth inhibition on top and, um, and then the growth recovery on the bottom here relative to time above MIC first. Um, so based on the R squared values, what we see is there was actually a very good correlation with time above MIC, which would suggest a time dependent mechanism. Um, the correlation with AUC to MIC was there, but it was much weaker. So the R squared values are lower. And then in co contrast to what we would expect for a peak dependent drug, the outcome actually did not correlate at all with peak to MIC. So we thought that amicacin should be peak dependent, but it really was not behaving in a peak dependent way with um, M-obsessus. So all this suggests a time dependent effect of amicacin on mycobacterium obsessus. So based on these data, we can identify a target time above MIC. So that's what I'm showing you here um, to achieve optimal microbiologic outcome. So the target to achieve 80% effect is shown here in red, and now it's 40% time above MIC is our proposed target. So the next thing we did was look to see what human dose, um, and this is all using pediatric data because I'm a pediatrician. Um, so what human dose would be needed to achieve this 40% time above MIC? So using this target of 40% time above MIC, we can predict dosing strategies that will give us the op optimal microbiologic outcome. So what I'm showing you here um, are simulated data that were computer modeled based on published pediatric PK data for amicacin. So these graphs depict simulated um, profiles for different dosing strategies. There are a lot of data here, so I want you to just focus on um, a couple of things. So first is the line at 0 0.8. So basically any data points above this line are likely to achieve our target. So we're going to get to our time above MIC um, more than 80% of the time if we're above this target. Um, I also want you to look at the red line that I added here. So based on published data, the red line represents uh, the average m obsessus MIC. So our MICs for amicacin are often pretty high, and the average is around 16. So ideally, we would want a drug dosing strategy that's above the black line, particularly when we are at an MIC of 16. And what you can see is there are very few dosing strategies that achieve this, and really there's only one, actually, and that's 90 milligrams per kilo per day um, every eight hours, which is far from what we are doing right now. Um, what, what happens if you sort of allow a slightly lower MIC, which some of our organisms will have, or you allow a lower likelihood of reaching our target, then somewhere in the 8 to 12 hour um, range for dosing gets a bit closer to that. But what you can see is that our every 24 hour or three times a week dosing, which is what we're doing right now, doesn't even get close to matching what, what our target time above MIC would be. So I told you that one of the reasons we use amicacin less frequently is to reduce toxicity. Uh, so the next question is whether or not more frequent dosing would result in increased toxicity. So what I'm showing you here is, again, computer simulated data um, predicting risk of nephrotoxicity on the left and then ototoxicity on the right. So we can see that the risk of nephrotoxicity, which is tied to the trough concentration of amicacin, remains below 10%, even at every eight hour, every 12 hour dosing, um, if we use 45 milligrams per kilo per day or less. 
ototoxicity is actually proposed to be based on a cumulative AUC. And so because it's AUC dependent, if we're using the same total daily dose, every eight hour, every 12 hour, and every 24 hour are going to be the same in terms of the ototoxicity risk. So we really aren't increasing our ototoxicity risk with that. Um, and again, if you, the, the ototoxicity it's predicted to be pretty low, especially if we use the 45 per kilo daily dose or lower. So based on this, I recommend um, that we at least start to consider um, a change in our dosing of amikacin for imobsessus. So I would propose somewhere in the range of um, 45 milligrams per kilo per day divided every 8 to 12 hours to be able to improve microbiologic outcome. And based on our simulated data, we predict an acceptable toxicity risk with this. Uh, combination therapy remains really important as we saw that resistance develops quite rapidly. Um, and so that's something that we really you know, want to keep thinking about. I'm not saying that everyone should go out and change how they're <laughs> giving amikacin right now, because this is obviously you know, preliminary data, but at least something that we can start to think about. And then really the most important conclusion from my talk today is that um, imobsessus is not Pseudomonas. Um, <laughs> so I know we talk a lot about Pseudomonas here, and it's a lot easier to study in many ways, but um, all of our dosing and all of our data for um, sort of how we decide to treat these bacteria, M. obsessus and other NTM, is based on Pseudomonas and other typical bacteria. And I propose that really we can't um, make that inference quite as easily as we think. Um, NTM are slower growing, they have different cell walls, they often have higher MICs, they're just totally different organisms. And I think that really we need to um, change how we think about dosing antibiotics for them. So I know I'm out of time. I want to just thank um, particularly the group at CHLA. This is me with my mentor, um, Dr. Neely. A couple days ago, we have a, we get very serious about Halloween at CHLA. Um, so this is the whole infectious disease division competing. Um, and I absolutely want to thank my uh, funding from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, both during fellowship and then now as junior faculty with the Schwachman. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. This is now open for discussion. Joy, great talk. Hi, um, Andrea Hahn from Children's National. So I am assuming all the data you presented to us today is assuming like an IV amikacin dose for the intensive phase. Mm -hmm. um, and so as you pointed out, the IV dose seems like it much would have to be much higher, much higher than what we're us typically using at this point. Um, what about inhaled? Have you started to think about how you might model inhaled amikacin because the thought that you can get higher levels through that mechanism. Yeah, definitely have started to think about it. Um, <laughs> have not done it yet, but that's very much um, on the list that I'd like to do. Because I think really that is an often sort of ignored component of, of um, amikacin, PKPD, and, and we're giving inhaled amikacin for a long time. And um, to do that, we really ideally would have the concentrations of amikacin in the lung, which is much harder to get than, than concentrations in the blood. Um, but I definitely am thinking about ways to try to model that and, and be able to improve that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, related, slightly different question. Um, I was thinking as you were talking, that was really nice data, but your model data is all about blood PK, isn't mm -hmm. it? And I think we, we're not very good at thinking about what actually gets through into the environment that we need to treat, are we? And obviously it's going to be different for different severity of lung diseases and how thick the mucus plugs are and everything. Mm -hmm. Can you think of a way to try and address that, which would perhaps tie in with looking at PK of directly administered drug, but, but could actually give us some useful information about what's happening when we use the IV as well? Yeah, um, really the best is to look at the concentration of amikacin in the lung, which we can't really get in real time in, in humans often, although sometimes I think there has been some attempt to sort of look at it in like BAL fluid, things like that. Um, there are some mouse studies that have tried to quantify amikacin in lung tissue um, to, to better get at that, um, but there's definitely more that we can do do, um, but it's difficult to model it without knowing exactly what those concentrations are that, that we're reaching. Um, but I think a very important question. Yeah. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this talk. One, one question that I have is uh, on the strain that you use, the ATCC strain. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do we think that this is representative of the type of um, 
uh, chronic amebcesis infections that um, that develop in in people with cystic fibrosis, and and can we um, is it safe to extrapolate the the data um, to um, to patients? Yeah, great question. So um, I've been um, talking with Jerry Nick a lot to try to sort of get more um, basically NTM isolates and so um, have developed a collaboration there so that I can get additional um, imobsessus isolates as well as look at MAC because um, I think really there's a huge um, breadth of, of possible NTM that we see and so being able to better understand if this is something that is um, the same throughout the hollow fiber and the, the hollow fiber experiments are very um, large and time consuming and expensive so I can't really do that many of them um, but I, I do um, definitely plan to do at least you know a couple of additional and obsessive strains that are from patients and compared to Mac as well would you say the growth properties are similar you know in, in terms of mm -hmm. the growth curve kinetics are they are they similar to those reported for um, cystic fibrosis isolates they yeah the ATCC does does generally behave pretty similarly mm -hmm. Very good. Two, two quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, so you look specifically at subspecies obsessus, so mm -hmm. do you, which is genotypically more resistant. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have plans to look at subspecies miscellaneous um, and yes. you know have considerations that that might pan out differently just because of other drugs that are more available, specifically the macrolide? Yeah, I actually included it. Um, there's only, there's much fewer arms. I, so I did have a couple of arms actually that had uh, Maslians as well. Um, and it did seem like it was behaving fairly similarly, but I would like to expand on that. And I am working with azithromycin too in the lab. And so sort of um, definitely tying that in is something that's I think really important. And then my, my other question, some of this may be my own ignorance of how fiber models modeling, but you know, do you have the ability to look at not only amikacin isolated as a single drug, but pairing it with another drug, you know, specifically maybe a beta-lactam, which we know is the other kind of major IV antibiotic that we use to see again if there may be some synergistic effects or other ways that we could potentially lower the amikacin dose? Yes. Just for feasibility and toxicity reduction. Yeah, so the, the great thing about the hollow fiber system is that we can really do a large number of, of antibiotic combinations in that. Um, again, it's sort of limited by space and cost somewhat, but that is kind of um, another step that I am planning now is actually sort of combination, particularly with azithromycin since that's important, but also other um, of our key antibiotics that we use for um, imobsessus treatment and looking to see how um, the, the best combination therapy really for them. How, how do the bacteria become resistant? Where, where are the mutations developing? Um, these 30 S ribosomal mutations or oh, what's, that's, what's happening? That's a really good question. I don't actually know the answer to that. It is kind of terrifying how quickly yeah. it develops. There is, um, there is a fairly high baseline resistance that happens that's from mutations, but I don't exactly know sort of what the mutation is, but this is, this is too slow to go back, but I was going to try to show you the, um, there, there is a relatively, it's about one in every 10 to the seventh, um, organism is at baseline amicacin resistant. So I think it's just that that is able to emerge pretty quickly with monotherapy. So, uh, oh yeah, there you go. So you can see this is actually our, our baseline resistance, Oop, just in control. So there's actually a lot of amicacin resistance that's sort of just hanging around. So I think once we start to treat with amicacin, it blossoms. Uh, so there's some blossoms. resistance already in, yes. in this strain, even at baseline. Yes, wow. yeah. And this has been described by a couple other groups as well, so yeah. Let's see, do we have any other questions in the, in the app? Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Dr. You. Gibson, and to all of our speakers today. These were fantastic talks. Thank you.